and Nick talking about the inter Internet of Things, which make beer. They are from the Center of Quantum Technologies in the Physics Department. And, well, the rest I let them talk about. So everyone, give a round of applause to Nick and Marcus. Okay, um, so first of all, so this is Nick and I'm Marcus. Um, so we have actually been here, or at least I've been at a similar place at last Geek Camp. So we thought we'd bring around some beer this time of the, the year again. But um, of course we have to find some sort of geeky uh, um, title. So we are going to oversell it a little bit and uh, going to show you that while you are brewing you can actually also explore, explore the Internet of Things. And um, uh, first of all I want to thank you all for coming. It's the last session before the after party. Um, okay, so there are closing remarks, so you should all go to the closing remarks and then we all go together to the after party. But it's a long day, and um, so, uh, and we have the great honor of being the last speaker. Um, so I want to introduce uh, how we usually introduce ourselves. So we are at the Center for Quantum Technologies here at NUS, so we actually uh, work down the campus. And um, we are physicists by training, and we can actually prove that. So most of us, we have these, uh, these pictures where we actually stand in the lab and randomly touch optics <laughs> so, so that it looks good. So, uh, and we actually also publish from time to time, as you can see on top of that. Okay? So, so this is not how we typically work. This is how we sort of are portrayed on our website. Um, uh, we are also makers. Uh, um, Kinda by, by our like chosen profession in physics, we do a lot of stuff. But we actually go to the makers fair every year. So and you can see that uh, this is a, uh, so every people, every person that looks a bit crazy in this picture is actually a physicist. So this is a professor, <laughs> uh, professor at NUS. And in the back, you see Nick with the slightly longer beard. Uh, and I, I took the picture, so I'm not on it. But lastly, we are brewers, and so I guess that's the reason why why we are here today. And um, it's actually a very nice community in Singapore, so I had to look around for a picture of us actually drinking. And there was uh, two years ago uh, at the uh, Homebrew Challenge, where there is all, these are all people that do homebrew. So it's a very friendly community, and you can see Nick even spotted a longer beard at some point. And uh, so um, we have been doing this for about uh, four years now, and um, I can only uh, um, and, uh, ask all of you to, uh, at the end of this talk, or at the at the end of the session and most likely during the beers in the after party. If you're interested in brewing after this talk or before this talk, just come to us and, and talk to us. And brewing is after all best discussed uh, over uh, a cold beer. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so now you know sort of why we are here. So we, we, we are the people that, uh, that brew and we actually brought beer. So um, we have brought two kegs, uh, it's about 40 liters of homebrew beer, so you have to actually stick around, you have to come to the after party, and then you can actually uh, see how rewarding a hobby this, uh, this brewing is, because you actually at the end get to taste some beer. Okay? Okay, so, and we got told not to bring it to NUS, <laughs> so it's for the after party. Um, okay, so, but as it's not only about sort of making beer and, and, and sort of drinking it, but it's also uh, uh, one part of, of how we got into this brewing. It actually is it's quite geeky. So you can do a lot of things on a lot of different uh, um, parts of the brewing process, which are actually quite uh, nice hobbies if you're into sort of geeky stuff. Um, so in this talk, uh, we will sort of split it in two. Um, uh, we will start with a, a very brief ish introduction on how beer is actually made. Uh, so for you, those of you who actually don't know it and just drink it. And then uh, the second um, part will be uh, the type, type of in our title, uh, basically how we ended up trying or maybe succeeding in using the Internet of Things to connect uh, our brewery to the Internet. So and then Nick will start with how to brew. Oh, yeah, so by the way, this is uh, just, um, all this talk is going to be about how we just uh, just try out different uh, texts. So if you're interested in, um, in in having a reason to try out the latest text, just start uh, brewing. So on to the best part, the beer. Mm -hmm. So beer is made of four ingredients officially. So you've got water, grains, hops, and yeast. You can get fruit beers where they add fruit juice, but 
If you're German, it's not allowed because there was a purity law in 1516, I think, called the Reinheitsgebot. And that means you can only put them four ingredients in your beer. So we first start off with the, the malt, which is usually made from, uh, comes from barley. You can also use wheat. So first, it's called malt because it's been malted. So if you get barley grains, um, from, or I cut them off the stem, they'll be unmalted. So what you do is either soak them or warm them up and that causes them to germinate and then they would grow another barley, uh, barley plant. But the germination, what that does is it changes the, the, the really long complex starches in there into shorter ones that the, the plant can then use as food to grow. But you don't want it to grow into a barley plant, so you stop the germination after two days and then it's malted and it's ready to be used in making beer. So uh, this is what malts look like. So the, the very white one is wheat malt, which would make a, white, a wheat beer or a bison. And then the other ones are different types of barley, where the dark one has been roasted in an oven about 150 degrees, and that gives you a darker beer, i.e. stouts and a, a, a box. So you can buy the malt in Singapore. There's two homebrew stores. One's called uh, iBrew, and that's in Clemente, and the other one is called the Homebrew Co-op, which is on the top of Five and Dime, which is at River Valley. So what we do with the malt is we basically mash it. So mashing involves basically making porridge or cooking it at about 65 degrees. What this does is that the enzymes inside the malt break the starch down into sugars. That's what we want, which we call the wort. So the water is sugary water. So anything with sugary, you can basically ferment. So the mashing process, we keep them, like I say, constant at 60, 64 to 72 degrees. The temperature determines what type of sugars you get out. So at the lower temperatures, 64, you get out short grain sugars, which the yeast find easier to eat. So then you get a drier beer in the end, which is what mostly Pilsners are made at, about 64. But if you drink things like English beers or stouts, they might be at a sweet finish and that'll be due to them being mashed at a higher temperature because the yeast cannot convert all their sugars then in the wort into alcohol, so it'll end up being a bit sweeter in the finish. So tech helps, you can do all this manually. So it was a conundrum for us. We could keep it manually at the right temperature, but that would involve a lot of human feedback loop basically measure temperature add warm water add cold water keep it at the right temperature but you can basically implement a feedback loop with an electric heater uh, in what we this is actually a kettle for double boiling uh, chickens for making chicken rice but you can buy it from basically chinatown lao choi Seng on temple street for about 300 dollars so it's basically a big, massive electric water heater, and it holds about 40 litres of liquid. So we then built some electronics, which we added on the bottom. So the electronics is powered. Its brain is an Adreno. Oh, well, we went through many iterations. We had a Raspberry Pi and an Adreno, but let's just say its brain is an Adreno that implements what's called a Bang Bang a digital PID controller. So we put a temperature probe in the liquid and measure the temperature if it is too hot, then the heater is off. If it's too cold, the heater is on. But it's a little bit more intelligent because it actually implements a PID algorithm so that we calculate the duty time that the heater comes on for and goes off for in a 30 second duty, uh, duty cycle. So after we've basically kept the, the, the wort or the mat, we've mashed for an hour, usually mash for an hour to two hours to extract all the sugars from the grains. And after we've done that, then we uh, <coughs> basically take out the, the wort from the, uh, from the grain, separate it using a, a tap at the bottom of the mash tun, and then we put this in a boil kettle. And the reason why we boil is to sanitize. So anything with sugar in it will go basically moldy or go off or rancid because in the air it's full of yeast and bacteria that get in your food and make it go off. So we then sanitize the wort by boiling it, which kills everything except for some very nasty bacteria, but usually they're much slower growing and the yeast outcompete them, so you'll never get sick drinking beer. Actually, beer and bread are one of the few things that you cannot really get ill for. You cannot screw it up, basically. Meat is a whole different story, but beer is fine. So when we do the boil, we add hops. The reason we add hops is the initial reason hops are added 
So before hops were discovered in Germany, uh, they used to add basically <laughs> weeds from your garden to act as a preservative. So even with, when the, the sugar's been converted to alcohol, the alcohol can still spoil and turn into bigger vinegar. So then you've got malt vinegar after a few weeks, but the monks and things wanted to keep the beer longer, so they added basically weeds that acted as basically preservatives. But then they found that hops was a much better preservative and had a few less side effects of adding woodworm to your beer and mugwort and other things. So hops is actually an alkaloid, which is very good to help you go to sleep. So it's one of the reasons why you might be tired after having a skin full of beer. There may be many other reasons as well. Uh, so it adds bitterness, which is the usual thing you, you feel, and it adds flavour and aroma. So tiger beer has no flavour or aroma. They just inject pure extract of hops to add preservatives and bitterness properties, and it's very flavorful. I We have one beer at Sapporo that is very hoppy, it's a summer ale, and you'll really then taste and smell the hops. So that's why we add hops to preserve and add bitterness. So this is what hops actually look like. They're uh, basically a cone plant. They're actually in the same fam family as cannabis, and they smell very similar. So it smells very dank when you've got a big concentration. And it's not fun to bring them in from abroad through China because the drugs dogs don't know the difference. <laughs> <laughs> and neither do the custom officers because, you know, what are hops? <laughs> so then to do the boil, we just basically stick it on a stove. So we've got a six kilowatt stove and that boils it aggressively. We do that for an hour to extract the right amount of bitterness from the hops and flames. So now what? So now we've got the hot, poppy, sugary water. We need to cool it down quickly. The faster we cool it down, the faster we can add the yeast, the faster the yeast can start eating and reproducing. Because once alcohol gets in there, it sanitizes everything. That's why you can use alcohol for sanitizing things. So we want the yeast to start eating and out competing anything else quicker. This is the case for the majority of beers, except for a certain style called Lambic, where they actually really insist on adding bacteria to sour your beers like you would with a yogurt or kimchi. But that's a different style of beer. Uh, so we cool it down quickly using basically heat, uh, some copper coils that we put cold water through that's dumped into the wall, and that cools it down quickly to about 20 degrees where we can pitch the yeast. So, so then we do the fermentation where we add the yeast where this, over the period of basically three, to three days to three weeks, depending on the yeast type and the style of beer, it will eat the sugars and convert them into alcohol. So yeast can probably ferment up to about 22% alcohol. After that, they kind of die if you've got a highly modified one. So after, if you want to make a spirit, then you distill at about 22%. But usually we aim to make beers about 5% because they're basically sessionable and you don't end up drunk in five seconds. So the problem with Singapore, except for one style of beer, is it's too damn hot. Unless you are very rich and leave your aircon on all day, you can't really ferment beer in your HDB. So you want to use something to keep it at about 20 degrees. Lagers are fermented at 12 to 9 degrees. Ales are fermented at 24 to 18 degrees. So what we did is we converted a chest freezer, again using a bang bang controller, in the opposite direction. But this time we didn't implement a PID because it's not that necessary. So if we get within one degrees of the set point, so the, the fridge is too warm. So the Adreno says, turn on relay, so it turns on the mains power to the fridge, the fridge or the freezer comes on, cools down below the set point, a degree below, fridge goes off, warms up, so it just oscillates for basically three weeks. And then we can cool it right down to about two degrees. And uh, so after it's fermented, we will then transfer it to this keg here, and we'll cool it for two weeks, um, which is called aging. So when a beer is young, you get a lot of green apple flavours and you can chill these out for about two weeks and then it's about drinkable. So in the period of about a month, you can start with the fresh ingredients and end up making beer. So the, the mashing process and the boiling process takes about five hours, so it's actually quite a bit of work. And then the fer fermentation, you don't do much, that takes about two weeks. And then age in two weeks, then you can either bottle it or keg it. Keg it is so much easier because you just pour the beer into a big keg. Bottling takes about two hours because you pour it into 60 individual bottles. So then finally kegging and drinking, which provided us with even more tech. So we found an old fridge that had been thrown out at the bottom of this HDB. <laughs> we took it back upstairs and we realised it didn't really work properly because the compressor wouldn't start. 
So again, we're using the Adreno to send uh, another pulse to the starter coil of the compressor because the starter had broken. So it does that for 10 milliseconds. It starts up the compressor and then that runs and keeps the fridge cold. But if you turn the starter coil on too long, you blow up your compressor. So it had to be very kind of precise. And sometimes it didn't start for some reason. So 10 milliseconds wasn't perfect. So we then made a device to measure the amount of current drawn by the compressor because when it's going to explode, it draws seven 100 watts instead of 150 watts, so we measured the power it drew, and if it did that, we turned it off and then tried again. <laughs> so we got a bit silly, we probably could have just bought a second hand fridge for $150 instead of spending the 28 hours it was debugging and making the system just to power this fridge. The fridge lasted for two years and then it died on its own. So it is a lot of tech, you don't have to do all the tech, but it was. I'd have spent 10 to 50 hours making tech instead of the extra hour it would take every brew session to make the beer. So it saves effort every brew session, but you do put a lot of effort in building tech. But to be honest, I enjoyed making the, more the tech than making the beer. I was never really a big beer drinker. <laughs> and just making the tech, I got more into beer actually just making it. Anyway, back over to Marcus. Uh, we'll tell you about how we mostly temperature controlled everything with yeah. the tech. So, so, um, so thanks, Nick. So, so far, you have seen, okay, so this is how we do, do brewing beer, and actually, this is how we've done it, let's say, after a trial and error period of a year or two. And it's actually quite simple. So, if you, if you come from like a physics background, it's actually mostly temperature control, and it's actually very simple electronics. Um, and like you should probably not tell that the, our professors, I actually got the permission. So, we, we borrowed a lot of uh, electronics of our center. And, um, and it's actually, um, it's a fairly straightforward thing. So you, you have to measure the, the temperature, and all that is actually doing is you measure a single voltage across some um, thermistor, so it's a resistor that varies with temperature, and so you need one analog in, yeah? And then uh, you need to change something. So Nick told you you either heat or you actually cool, yeah? So that is a one digital out, and it's usually a relay that goes to something else. And, um, Okay, so there's some calculation, but the calculation is, is very simple, so um, you don't need a big system to it. But you also want to control it, so you either want to control it via the computer. Uh, some of our devices are actually sort of just set by, by buttons and you have a little LCD display, or you just have something that runs closed loop, so you don't even look at it. Okay, so all of that, these three uh, requirements, is actually a perfect job for the Arduino. It's sort of like what it's intended to be doing anyway. So. Uh, naturally, we started with this, well, actually, we didn't start with this, but after the very discrete logic um, that we did in the beginning, we, we started going over to this Arduino. Okay, and that uh, is actually like you can, even if you're not um, uh, familiar with electronics, you can actually just read up on the internet and you're pretty fast, you're at the stage where you can make your own brewery. Okay, so, and last year's talk was basically about all this, uh, all this stuff, and um, we got a bit better. <laughs> we actually uh, documented uh, some of that stuff, so you can find it on our GitHub. And again, there's this beer can la. There's also a blog that goes with it. So there's even a T-shirt that goes with it. So there's beercanla.com. But we also have a GitHub account, and you can find the the Arduino. You can find the the hardware, uh, at least the schematics. You can find the software, and and also all the other failed projects of the uh, uh, of the next um, ten minutes. Okay, so you can check that out, and um, if, you, if you don't understand it, you can just ask us. And if you need any of the hardware, you can probably also ask us. I mean, the, the, the parts, we can um, source them for you. Oh, so in principle, it's open source and open hardware. Okay, so, okay, so we have, I don't know, 10 minutes left, so are we done with our talk? No, because uh, uh, we, are, we are now coming to part B, so the Internet of Things. So why uh, on earth would we do that? So use the Internet of Things uh, for a brewery. Well, um, honestly, <laughs> we don't have a good answer for that. But we sort of, at some point, we decided it gets a bit boring not having to fix your brewery because it's running so nicely. So, <laughs> so we needed to find new projects. Okay? <laughs> so, but there's absolutely no, so everything worked perfectly. And the, the, the second part of the talk is just like, basically, we just like doing that stuff and suddenly we stopped doing it because uh, the brewery was finished. Okay, so that, that's us, so we get otherwise a bit bored. And um, so the, the, the real thing is, so we looked at this brewery, you, you had your computer, you talked to the Arduino, you set the things, the beer turned actually out like what you would have expected it, so it's actually become predictable, but somehow it didn't feel like magic. So at one point we were really like there, 
this is, this is not cool enough. So we sort of have to have it cooler. And um, so, so then Nick came up like, how, why, how can we not just have this thing via our smartphone? And we were like, sure, I mean, we are physicists, so let's just, let's just do it. And um, uh, the problem we faced, we had no clue about smartphones and how to program the thing and so on. So we are very much hardware guys. So, so doing the electronics is, is fine, but then, you know, all this Android, iOS, I will be like, okay, we don't know. So we just tried to, to go from the fastest way from an Arduino based tech to some smartphone control. Okay, and I'm um, spoiler alert, <laughs> we haven't succeeded yet, but we are on our way there. And this is actually a problem that, that, you, that many people sort of face quite often, is because you, you start by, other people face sort of the opposite problem, so they, they know a lot about smartphone programming, and then they're like, oh, how do I turn a relay on? But we sort of face the other thing, so how do we sort of go from, from an Arduino based system to something which feels uh, more like magic? Uh, and, of course, during that time, uh, two years ago or something, all these uh, Kickstarters started with the Internet of Things, and we thought, like, this is exactly what we need to do. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to co use all these great new technologies that came up to, um, to make our brewery wireless and, and smart and magic, and we can check in from work, and I don't know what you would do, but at least you can check in. Um, so. We followed three uh, routes, and they're basically um, in the, uh, increasing time. Uh, so, so actually, that's also sort of when these things came out. But it's also an increasing um, change to the setup. So, the first thing we tried is we ran a web server on a Raspberry Pi, and uh, connected our Arduino system to that uh, um, that Raspberry Pi, and then accessed somehow the Raspberry Pi with the with the phone or with another computer. Um, that worked until the Raspberry Pi died. Uh, <laughs> and then we went on, okay, so let's not do that. That somehow seems like, yeah. And then the Arduino Yoon came up. And that's this Arduino which is supposed to be wireless. So we thought, like, this is ideal. So we sw swapped our system over to the Arduino Yoon. And that also worked until we figured out that we probably did not do the smartest thing. And um, it had its own problems. And then, uh, I'm not sure how many of you know the Spark Core, but this is like the Internet of Things tool. So, so we bought it, and we used it, and um, I'm just giving you a one slide summary of it later, because it's, it's amazing, but uh, maybe we got a bit out of hand for our brewers at that point. So. Okay, so the web server on the Raspberry Pi. Sounds like straightforward. you probably all software guys, so let's set up a web, web server. This is a Raspberry Pi. Actually, I think that's a new one. But anyway, so uh, it, it's a small computer. You can SSH into it. Uh, you can set USB ports, so you can plug in your Arduino. And uh, so the change is very minimal to your setup. Instead of a computer controlling it, it's a Raspberry Pi. And you just, and I just say you just, have to make a, a web server that you can then access the Raspberry Pi. OK. Strategy is the phone connects to the Raspberry. That connects to the Arduino and that connects to the brewery. Okay, it might be not the fastest route between phone and brewery, but at least it seemed the easiest. Okay, it works. Yeah, so <laughs> sort of. So you can find it on GitHub, um, and it's actually a very good starting point for people who actually know software. So it's a full system. So it's a, it's a, it's a real Linux and so on, and you can. You learn from a lot of examples online, so we, we just forked the, some other GitHub project and that was all jQuery and we were like, okay, we just want to add a button here. And it took us like uh, two weeks to figure out how to do a button in jQuery. So, uh, so, yeah, you've never used it before, it's like, okay. Uh, okay, and then? So the converse, we have like we are completely out of our depth. So we somehow felt we just now need to do all this web design uh, server thing that we didn't really want to do. So um, so it, it ran. We could use it. Uh, the interface was like clunky, but it did work. And but we also came into a very practical problem. So this is our brewing setup. So this whole thing gets very hot, about 100 degrees when it's boiling. And we strapped the Raspberry Pi to the bottom of it. And after a few months, the Raspberry Pi decided that this is probably not the best way to be operated. <laughs> okay, so that's actually good news because now you had to do something. Okay, 
So by, by having to do something, we were back to the engineering phase and we sort of liked it. I mean, we could have just replaced the Raspberry Pi with it. Would be beyond the point. Okay, so Raspberry Pi is that. <laughs> Next approach. Okay, by that time, uh, you could buy an Arduino Yoon. Okay. Um, so, and it's basically meant to be compatible. So you're meant to be slotting in the Arduino Yoon where previously your Arduino was. And then somehow they promise you can use wireless things to connect to it. Okay, so this is how it looks, very much like an Arduino, except that there's a, a like an Uno, except there's this silvery box, which which is where the magic happens, where you can sort of connect via this, this tool it, it runs some sort of embedded Linux or something. So it's almost as powerful as a Raspberry, but way less. But it has some Arduino magic that you can uh, um, expose it wirelessly easier. Okay, um, it also works, <laughs> so, so you can again find it. Um, uh, it's actually kind of like, it's actually good. I mean, it, this, is, this is the problem that the Arduino Uno is meant to solve. So if you want to control like analog and digital things wirelessly, you should by all means go for it and just, you know, do that. And uh, another pro is there's like, a, there's this beautiful REST API and we're like, Wait, what? What is REST? So, so we are literally like, that, really? Do we? Can you not just do something else?" And they were like, "No." So you had to learn REST. Okay. So this was the the comp. That's a beautiful REST. <laughs> <laughs> so um, again, I, I think it's meant for people who you know do that every day and somehow have decided that REST is the way to do things. But for people that don't know what REST is, it's a very big mental hurdle to learn at some point. Okay. So. Um, and we, we ran into this problem that so you have your phone and you have your brewery and you have Yoon and now you're supposed to rest something to the Yoon. <laughs> but how are you going to do that? It's like it's, it's not really like you know you somehow have to build something on your phone that, that does that and we are like okay maybe we don't really want to do that. Okay so it works so we, we got something not on the phone but we got something on a computer that basically sends rest things to the Yoon and it's, it's working. <laughs> So it's perfect, but it's somehow it's 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 a bit weird if you if you if you really want to have some you you somehow don't really need this this Arduino unit. It's almost the same as the Raspberry Pi, um, except you sort of like hit some complexity, but you're stuck with the same sort of. You basically have to another web server or something that does the the rest thing. Okay, so um, so okay, so then we also face the problem of developing apps and so on. So we thought, ideally, we thought we could just, you know, enter something on the browser. But no, you have to do some sort of app on your on your um, phone or on your on your computer. Okay, and then um, there's another problem. So this is <laughs> it's always the same problem. So we had this uh, beautiful design, and so now it's wireless. So this is a big uh, piece of metal, and you uh, turn it upside down, and then you're trying to connect to it wirelessly. Yeah. And um, and it's really like it's like you can't really you can't really find any signal <laughs> somewhere. So 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 it was really fast. And we, in the middle of the brewery, we we're like, oh, damn, you know, maybe we move it to this place of the kitchen and have Wi-Fi signal. <laughs> and that is that is I mean that can be changed. But if if, if you go from something which is wired to something that's wireless, you should keep in mind that you're making something wireless. <laughs> okay. Um, Oh, that should be number three. Okay, so the last thing, uh, um, actually, to be honest, we went back to this wire solution. But the, the last thing we thought, and we actually, I, I think I even bid for this Kickstarter of SparkCore. Anyway, we got one of these beautiful things. Um, they're small, like if you ever see one of them, they're like tiny, like, and they're, they are like amazing. So you get them, and immediately they tell you, you know, open your iPhone, and you do, and then like, and then now connect to your Spark on you're like, okay, and then now type in this internet address and you're like, okay, and then now you talk to that thing and, and suddenly you, you, you talk to the device over the internet without having actually done anything. So you're like, wow, like amazing. So we're like, okay, cool, but actually do you want to expose your brewery to the internet? And we're, like, <laughs> <laughs> we're like, maybe not. So we thought like, oh, let's just run it in our intranet. And this is, I mean, they tried to change it, but this is almost impossible to do, okay? 
<laughs> so and at that time, there was on all the forums where like, yeah, yeah, we get the int an internet thing working, but you basically have to duplicate their their server and everything. And so we like, okay. So at that point, we were like, okay, maybe we got it a bit out of hand, and um, we stopped. Uh, and actually uh, um, went back to the previous solution. So the Spark core we never touched again, <laughs> but we still have it. Okay. Um, so what I gave is like sort of the last session talk of things is um, we try to go from an Arduino based hack to smartphone control, yeah? and it's maybe not quite the Internet of Things, but at least it's it's fun. And um, what you should keep in mind is that it's actually um, all of these things work. Yeah. And they have been great fun to try out. I mean, we now know jQuery. We now know what the REST API is. Uh, we have bought all these ridiculous uh, microcontrollers, which we're never going to use again. And it's actually, it's actually very entertaining. Um, we can still brew, OK? We haven't destroyed anything. Um, it's yet not where we think, damn, that's cool. So we are still working on it. Um, we have, by now, uh, Android apps that, that control things and so on. So we're getting there. Um, but uh, if you really want to keep hacking, there's nothing better to do than um, start to brew. Because it's really like, you sort of have a purpose of, for hacking. Like, it's not like, oh, I blink an LED. No, you're, you're making beer. Okay? <laughs> so, um, so this is actually quite nice. And especially if you're, like the, the electronics hurdles, they're actually quite low. Um, so there's more like the software thing. And I'm sure most of you are much better than us. Okay. Um, so, um, but that's the end. So we're almost on time. Um, visit this blog up there, where you can find more about homebrew community. We are nice people. And um, come to also the, the yeah. The text on there, so all this we've talked about, yeah. it's written up on beer camera. Yeah, and then um, come talk to us at the after party. So first, we all go back to the closing remarks. And then at the after party, we can uh, have like an extended Q&A session uh, over beer. We might have a few minutes. Uh, I think we have time for just one, two questions at max. Okay, can you guys hear me? Okay, cool. Yes, Brian. During the fermentation stage, can you actually monitor something? Yes, yeah, so you, you, you monitor what's called the gravity. So it basically means dropping a plunger that measures how far it drops. So when you've got sugary water, it's more dense than water. So you measure, you measure the change in that, and that tells you from the starting amount of sugar to the final, that tells you the alcohol percentage. So there is another Kickstarter project called Beerbug, which is basically one of these devices and it sends it wirelessly over the internet to a mobile phone. <laughs> but it's actually, they've not got the hardware part right, so it just gives you useless information. The numbers just oscillate wildly. So And the problem, is, the problem is you have to open up your fermentation and typically that's something you try to avoid doing because then you can contaminate it. Yeah, can in, yeah, in, in, so, in, yeah. So that's, use yeah, so that's, that's the idea of the beer bucket and it sounds good in theory. It's not good. <laughs> you can measure the amount of CO2 coming off, but that's a challenging thing because you've got any leaks and stuff like that. And not all beers, some CO2 stays dissolved in the liquid and some doesn't. So you, it's not accurate enough. So you really do have to measure the chain. You could do, we were thinking about doing it optically because we work with optics, so making an optical refractometer so if light goes through a <laughs> liquid that is more dense, it bends more. So you can measure, do the difference, so it involves lasers and optics and 3D printers, but it's, that's going to be like at least 150 hours of time. It's not before you get anything useful out of it, so... <laughs> Yes. Uh, so that means you you measure the gravity like old school with a yeah, yeah, yeah. manual. Uh, How it's always been done. You can do it when we put a drop on a prism and then look at the light and also <laughs> can. But, no, but we really have like a yeah. Uh, kind of How it's been way. done for the last hundred years. Nobody's made anything better. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay. If not, let's thank Marcus and Nick.